Hello there. Today, I'd like to take you on an ASMR exploration of a very unique and special place, Jordan House in Hampshire. Like many historic houses, this small and atmospheric Elizabethan manor house is open to the public. But Jordan is far more than just another country house to visit because it has all sorts of interesting literary connections. The house once belonged to Jane Austen's brother, and uh, Jane Austen herself spent many hours of her life at the manor house, so consequently there are lots of wonderful Austen connections at Chawton House, which uh, we're going to look at today. Also, Since the early noughties, the house has also been the home to the Centre for the Study of Early Women's Writing, and uh, it holds a magnificent library of manuscripts written by women between 1600 and 1830. So, as we take a look around the house, we'll find lots of different things to enjoy. We'll find links to Jane Austen, but we'll also find the stories of some of the many wonderful authors whose work is kept in the library and uh, who were pioneers of women's writing. And then we'll also have the beautiful rooms to explore and admire, just as we would do in any other country house visit. As usual, there will be an accompanying slideshow of images on the video that you can look at if you wish to but you don't have to look at them at all. If you prefer, you can just close your eyes, relax, and let my voice guide you. So, welcome to Chawton House. Those of you who are fans of Jane Austen's work, or who have listened to my uh, previous recording that I made about Jane Austen, will know that she moved to the village of Chawton uh, when she was 33, and that she moved there after quite a turbulent period in her life. Life in Chawton really suited her. While she lived there, it was her most prolific period as a novelist. And uh, the reason she moved there was because her brother, Edward, had inherited Chawton House which is the big house in the village. And um, as part of the estate, he also inherited a bailiff's house, which was right in the centre of the village. This cottage became the family home for the Austin women. There was Jane, her mother, and her sister Cassandra. They moved there, and um, that was the beginning of a settled and far more secure and happy period in Jane Austen's life when she did a lot of writing. That cottage itself is now the Jane Austen's House Museum, which is a fabulous little museum. It's a place of pilgrimage for many Austen fans from all over the world. But not everyone who visits it realises that just literally down the road, there's another house with some fascinating Jane Austen connections. And uh, if you walk from the Jane Austen House Museum down a little lane from the crossroads outside her house, you'll walk down a a very pretty little road which is lined with leafy green trees and um, old thatched cottages. It's very picturesque. And uh, if you walk down there, you come to a low stone wall on the left-hand side, which um, acts as the boundary of a parkland. And if you keep walking, you'll come to the entrance of, uh, of the park, and you'll see a very impressive, long, straight gravel driveway that leads straight up to Chawton House. The reason Jane Austen's brother, Edward, was uh, able to inherit such an impressive house was because, well, he was basically very lucky. When he was 12 years old, he was singled out by um, some cousins of his father, uh, the Reverend Austen, who came to visit the Austen family. 
and uh, they were a very wealthy and uh, more importantly childless couple called Thomas and Catherine Knight. And when they visited the Austins, they really took a fancy to Edward and they sort of unofficially adopted him, which was quite a common practice in those days. And in fact, it, it happens in Jane Austen's novel, Emma. Frank Churchill is adopted by an aunt and an uncle. And uh, well, Jane Fairfax as well, she's not adopted by a family member, but she's sort of adopted by the family of uh, Colonel Campbell, who was a friend of her father's. And, uh, you know, this did happen. And Edward was uh, unofficially adopted by the Knights. And in time, they made him their legal heir. And this was a big deal because uh, they were very wealthy. They owned a lot of property. And uh, in time, Edward changed his name from Edward Austin to Edward Austin Knight. And he ended up inheriting three great big country estates, um, including Chawton, which was the uh, original seat of the Knight family. And uh, that inheritance was what allowed the, uh, the Austin women, the mother and the two sisters, to move to Chawton. And, uh, yeah, it changed their lives absolutely for the better. Moving to Chawton also came with a whole heap of additional advantages. When you think about Jane Austen living in Chawton, you think of her living in this sweet little cottage with her mother and her sister. It's easy to forget that she was also the sister of the local wealthy landowner and that she had access as a result, not just to her own home, but also to the big house, the great house just up the road. Edward didn't live there the whole time because he had another estate at uh, Godmersham in Kent where he mainly lived, but uh, he was there part of the time and when he was in residence Jane would visit him there. She would also go and visit him in Godmersham. And also the great house at Chawton was lived in at one point by Edward and Jane's brother, Francis, who was uh, in the Navy. And he came to Chawton with his wife and family and lived there. So this was a family house for Jane and she would walk up there and she would quite often go to dine there. And uh, she would also go there to just to escape um, life in the cottage and to give herself some peace and quiet, to give herself some time to sit and read, and just to have that space and time uh, that all writers need to develop their work. So Jordan House played a huge role in Jane Austen's life. and. Um, Today we're going to discover just how important it was to her, to her daily goings on. So let's follow in her footsteps now and walk up that long gravel driveway that leads to the house. The house itself has grey flint walls, tall mullioned windows and a gabled roof. And uh, it has... A large stone porch with an archway set into it, which we can walk through and go into the entrance hall. This is quite a narrow passageway with uh, a flagstone floor and uh, wood panelled walls. And we can turn pretty much straight away through a door on the left and walk into the first room in the house, which is the great hall. This great hall is uh, largely unchanged from the Tudor period when the house was built. Originally there was a medieval house on the site of the current manor house, but uh, that was pulled down and um, the new house was rebuilt by John Knight in 1583. Since then various generations of the Knight family have altered the house, changed it around, changed the rooms around, but this great hall is pretty much as it was. And uh, the first thing you notice when you enter the room is that there's an enormous stone fireplace on the wall opposite the windows. This is the original fireplace. And if we peer inside it, 
will see a carved metal fireback which is inscribed with uh, the phrase JK1588. And JK, of course, stands for John Knight. The house was built in the 1580s, so it could be that 1588 refers to a date when the room was finished or the house was finished, or it could just be a reference to the great victory that uh, happened for the English in 1588 with the defeat of the Spanish Armada. Above the fireplace, there's a carved wooden chimney piece that has uh, paintings of heraldic shields decorating it, and these bear the arms of various branches of the Knight family. And uh, on one side of the fireplace, there's a different type of carving, um, far less formal. If you look closely, you'll see a series of deep scratches in the wood. And these are known as witch marks. And uh, they're sometimes found scratched into the timbers of old buildings. They were made supposedly to ward off witches and evil spirits. They were often scratched into the woodwork around a door frame, a window frame or a fireplace. And uh, this was said to prevent the witches and the evil spirits from entering a house through the chimney or the doors or the windows. The Great Hall has dark wood panelling right around the room. It extends from the fireplace on both sides, right around all four walls. And uh, it continues about two-thirds of the way up the walls. Above the panelling, the walls are painted cream, and they're hung with a series of portraits. And you might expect in a house like this that the portraits on the walls would be members of the family. But, of course, Jordan House isn't an ordinary country house. It's also the centre for early women's writing. And what we see on the walls in here are portraits of women who were influential figures and writers from the 18th century. There is one portrait of Georges Sand, the French writer who was from the 19th century, but the rest of the ladies who feature on the walls in here are 18th century women writers. So we have one portrait that is said to be Georgina Cavendish, the Duchess of Devonshire. She is largely known today because of the film that was made about her life in 2008, starring Keira Knightley. And that film very much uh, dwelt on the Duchess's private life, which was somewhat turbulent, and on the fact that she was a leader of fashion. And both those aspects of her character are true. But um, as well as being a, a leader of fashion and uh, having a turbulent private life, she was also a very keen political activist, and she was a novelist and a poet as well. And next to the Duchess is a portrait of Mary Knowles, who was uh, a great character. She was an outspoken abolitionist, so she, she vehemently opposed the slave trade. And she was also a poet who uh, championed women's rights. And uh, next to her is another portrait of another woman who was a fierce anti-slavery campaigner and a campaigner for women's rights. And that's Amelia Opie. And she was a poet, a short story writer, and a best-selling novelist in her day. I actually own a volume of her short stories. It's not a first edition, but it is a third edition, and it was printed in 1809, and um, it's one of my most treasured volumes in my own personal book collection. But Amelia Opie was, uh, she was right at the centre of uh, literary society in the 18th century. She was a friend of Mary Wollstonecraft. She was a friend of Sir Walter Scott. Uh, she knew Richard Brinsley Sheridan. And it's interesting that uh, all those writers are still well known today. They're still famous. Their work has uh, remained in the uh, literary canon. And yet Amelia Opie herself has uh, all but disappeared. 
This is one of the aims of the Centre for Early Women's Writing at Chawton, to bring back these women, to raise them in the public consciousness and restore them to their rightful place in the literary tradition. Another writer who needs rediscovering, I think, uh, also has her portrait in the Great Hall, and that's Mary Robinson. And uh, if you've listened to my recording about the Wallace Collection, which is a fantastic museum in London, then uh, then you'll have come across Mary Robinson before because um, there are a couple of portraits of her in the Wallace Collection and... Um, <laughs> I spent quite a lot of time in that recording talking about her. Rather like Georgina, the Duchess of Devonshire, she is sort of remembered more today for having a bit of a scandalous reputation because she was one of the many mistresses of the Prince Regent. However, the reason she became the Prince Regent's mistress was because she was a, an actor of some repute. And um, after she retired from the stage, she became a really prolific author. She wrote novels, essays, political treatises, poetry. She had a prodigious output and she was really well received in her own lifetime. Samuel Taylor Coleridge, the poet, called her a woman of undoubted genius. And yet today her writing is, is barely known outside of academic circles. So again, she's one of the writers that the Centre for Early Women's Writing at Chawton is uh, trying to resurrect and uh, bring back into the public consciousness. Mary Robinson's portrait is on the far side of the Great Hall. And just to the left of it, there's a doorway which we can walk through now. We'll tiptoe up a short flight of stairs and walk along a panelled passageway to the dining room. This is another oak panelled room and uh, it has a very tranquil, atmospheric ambience. There's another splendid carved wooden chimney piece in this room and there's also a very large mahogany dining table and this table has a very interesting provenance because it dates from around 1813 and it was known to have belonged to Edward Austin and when you put those two facts together you realise that this table was consequently the place where Jane Austen would have sat when she came up to the Great House for dinner. And uh, there's a letter she wrote, actually, to her niece, Caroline, in 1815. And she writes that, We four sweet brothers and sisters dine today at the Great House. When she dined at the Great House that day, she would have been sitting at this very dining table. And so uh, if you're an Austin fan as I am, that's quite a, an incredible thing to be standing here looking at this dining table where Jane Austen came to eat her dinners. There are also quite a few connections to Edward Austen Knight in this room. There's a rather fine suit of clothes on display which are thought to belong to him. There are his grand tour journals that he made while he was visiting Switzerland and France in the 1780s. And there's also a full-length portrait of him, looking rather splendid in yellow breeches and uh, leaning nonchalantly on a fashionable walking cane. There's also a small silhouette picture, which was taken in 1793 and shows the young Edward Austen being introduced to the Knight family for the very first time. The other paintings in the dining room continue the theme of early women writers and uh, there's a lovely portrait of Mariah Graham and uh, she was the first woman really to make a career for herself as a professional travel writer. She went on a sea voyage to India when she was 23 with her father who was a naval commander and um, she married a naval officer 
Thomas Graham while she was out there and accompanied him on a voyage to Chile, which was a very uh, distant and exotic destination in the 1820s. She witnessed a terrible earthquake there that happened in 1822 and she was able to record her experience of it firsthand. She then moved to Brazil where she became uh, the tutor to a royal princess and she finally returned to Britain as a widow in 1825 and her travel writings were published by John Murray who had also been Jane Austen's publisher. Um, up until her death in 1817. Uh, Mariah Graham went on to travel extensively through Europe. She wrote about it. She published her accounts of uh, Spain and Italy. And uh, she was uh, a best-selling travel writer in her day. There's also a portrait in this room of Lady Mary Wortley Montague, and she was another formidable traveller. She was an English aristocrat who was the wife of the British ambassador to Turkey and she travelled extensively through the Ottoman Empire and wrote really quite fascinating accounts of what life was like there. Um, there's a volume of her letters from Turkey which is uh, well worth reading. Because she was a woman, she was able to visit the Turkish uh, segregated apartments that were reserved strictly for women and um, this gave her an insight into customs and practices that were hitherto unknown in the uh, European world. Lady Mary also witnessed, while she was in Turkey, the inoculation of a child against smallpox. And she herself had suffered through an attack of smallpox and she'd survived, um, but many people didn't. It killed a lot of people in the 18th century, and um, those who were left were often disfigured by the illness. So Lady Mary took it upon herself to champion the cause of inoculation, which she called engrafting, and she had her own children immunised against it, and wrote about the process, and uh, sent her account back to Britain, calling upon the medical establishment to adopt the practice. Her writings on this subject were uh, later to have a great influence on Edward Jenner, who of course is considered to be the father of immunology today. So she had uh, a huge impact on um, medical practices in Europe. And uh, she's another writer whose uh, work has largely been forgotten, but she's definitely worth rediscovering. Let's leave the dining room now and uh, walk up a flight of wooden stairs to the tapestry gallery. There aren't any tapestries in here, actually. Uh, there were in the 16th century, but they were sold off long ago, sadly, to pay off household bills. But it really doesn't matter that there aren't any tapestries left in here, because there are several other very interesting things to see. At the top of the stairs, there's a pair of portraits that show Thomas and Jane Knight, who are the couple who adopted Edward Austen Knight. And on the left-hand wall, there's a really lovely painting of Chawton House itself, which depicts it as it was in 1740. The house is shown a different colour. It's sort of, it has a sort of whitewashed render on the front of it. But other than that, it's really uh, exactly the same house as uh, it appears today with uh, the gables and uh, the stone porch and the red-tiled roof. There's a great uh, story attached to this painting. When it was being restored a few years ago, the conservationist who was working on it discovered um, in the bottom right-hand corner uh, an almost invisible piece of graffiti written in pencil that reads Mary Jane Austen 1819. Mary was Jane Austen's niece. Uh, she was the daughter of uh, Jane's brother Francis who, who lived at Chawton and uh, she was clearly another Austen female who uh, had an itch for scribbling. <laughs> On the opposite wall to this picture there's the most fantastic screen, which is huge. 
It measures nearly 13 feet wide. It's made up of several panels and it's covered with an enormous map of London. And this map was surveyed by John Rock in the 1740s. And uh, when it was published, it was printed on 24 individual sheets at a scale of 26 inches to the mile. So the whole thing altogether was huge. I've seen individual sheets from this map before, but until I visited Chawton House, I'd never seen the whole thing altogether. And as I'm quite a fan of old maps, it was really quite thrilling to, uh, to walk up these stairs into the tapestry gallery and see John Roke's map. However, I will drag myself away from the map and uh, lead you now into two interconnecting rooms, which are also extremely interesting. These are the study room and the exhibition room. In the original Tudor layout of Chawton House, um, these two rooms would have been one great chamber or solar room, which was uh, a room that you quite often found on the first floor of a Tudor house. It was designed to provide comfortable, dry, light, private accommodation um, for the house owners, because quite often the great halls that were downstairs, like the one we've already visited here, they were spaces where people would come to visit, you would receive guests, you would entertain, and the solar chamber was a more private space where the family could retreat to. Here at Chawton, the solar was divided into two smaller rooms in the 17th century, and these are now used as research and exhibition rooms for the Centre for Early Women's Writing. And uh, the centre hosts a different exhibition every year. This year, the 2019 exhibition is called Jane Austen's Reading. And it looks at the books that Jane Austen read herself and uh, the inspiration she drew from them for her own work. If you're a fan of Austen's work, this is a fantastic exhibition. I cannot recommend it enough. A lot of the books that are on display come from the Chawton House Library. Many of them are also actually part of Edward Austin Knight's original family library. Um, and of course that contained the volumes that Jane Austen herself borrowed and read. And uh, it's quite fascinating to see these works because you can see how they influenced Jane Austen's own writing. For example, there's a copy of the play Lover's Vows which is the play that the, uh, the bright young people of Mansfield Park decide they want to perform when they um, have the idea to do theatricals. There's also a copy of Fordyce's Sermons, which is the uh, incredibly tedious volume that uh, Mr Collins wants to read to the Bennet sisters in Pride and Prejudice. The next room that we'll go into also has some uh, very interesting Jane Austen connections. This is the oak room, and um, as the name suggests, it's panelled in oak, although the name of the room doesn't come from the panelling, but from the iron fireback that sits in the fireplace and uh, features a carving of, a, of an oak tree. This is thought to be the tree that Charles II hid in to avoid capture by uh, parliamentary forces during the Battle of Worcester that took place during the English Civil War. The main point of interest in this room for Jane Austen fans is the alcove, which is uh, on one side of the room, a snug little space with a mullioned window looking down the drive, which is known today as the reading alcove, because Knight family tradition says that it was where Jane Austen liked to sit and read when she was visiting the great house. Also in this room are some uh, miniature paintings, and one of these depicts Fanny Knight, who was uh, Edward Austen Knight's eldest daughter, and who was said to be Jane Austen's favourite niece. She described her as being almost another sister, and uh, lavished lots of attention and praise on her. But Fanny is uh, actually quite notorious in Jane Austen circles. 
Because much, much later on in her life, when Fanny was an old lady, she described her Aunt Jane as being not so refined as she ought to have been. And uh, she said that she was brought up in the most complete ignorance of the world and its ways. This seems incredibly ungracious uh, and ungrateful on the part of Fanny Knight, and uh, it's outraged generations of Jane Austen fans. But I think it's worth remembering that Fanny was an old lady when she made these remarks. I think she was 85 when she said them. The times had changed. You know, by that time it was the 1870s. High Victorian society was very different to uh, Regency society. And Fanny herself was by that time the matriarch of a baronet's family and uh, very entrenched in uh, high Victorian manners and high Victorian morals. And so by those standards, perhaps it was that Jane Austen did appear to Fanny, with hindsight, to be not so refined as she ought to have been. She was perhaps a bit too free and easy. Although, of course, to a modern reader, that's perhaps no bad thing. I do find her remarks about Jane Austen being ignorant of the world to be somewhat absurd, because um, anyone who's read Austen's work knows that she has this amazing understanding of uh, human behaviour and uh, an incredibly uh, deep insight into human psychology. But really, I think Fanny Knight's comments are probably best shrugged off with a laugh, and uh, hopefully Jane Austen herself would have shrugged them off with a laugh too. From the oak room, we'll step into a, an L-shaped chamber, which is known as the Long Gallery. And uh, Long Galleries were popular in Tudor and Jacobean manor houses because they allowed the ladies to take exercise indoors when it was raining outside. At one end of the gallery, on the east side, there's a really interesting cabinet that holds the records of the Society of Women Writers and Journalists, and uh, it's full of various trophies and cups that were awarded to uh, the members who were fated for uh, having done outstanding work in the field. And these include uh, the playwright Clement Dane and also the memoir writer Vera Britton. The... Long Gallery leads down um, the Great Staircase, and uh, if we walk down this, we'll find ourselves back on the ground floor of the house, in a marble-floored inner hall, which has been laid out in recent years as a rather charming little gift shop that sells lots of rather tempting books and gifts. Uh, I can't actually visit it without um, spending money in there because uh, there's always something that I want to buy. Usually when you get to the gift shop at a country house that's the end of your tour but uh, at Chawton there is actually one more room to visit because in one corner of this inner hall there's an oak door which is kept locked but if you knock on the door you will be admitted and uh, you can step into the lower reading room. This room, in Jane Austen's time, it would have been a parlour, but it was converted into a library in the 1870s, and it's now used to hold a selection of books from the, um, the library collection that's held by the Centre for Early Women's Writing. And uh, this room is just full of the most amazing books. The earliest volumes in the library's collection are stored in the underground archive. But on these shelves in this room, you'll still find works uh, by many amazing women writers like Mary Shelley, Anne Radcliffe, and of course, Jane Austen herself. Most of the books in here are obviously very old, and they're hardbacked, leather-bound, and stamped with beautiful gilt lettering, as many old books are. There is uh, one shelf, however, which isn't quite as it appears. On the surface, it looks to be a collection of weighty volumes of trial notes, but uh, these aren't actually real books. 
they're actually fake and uh, they hide the opening to a secret compartment which uh, opens to reveal a handy space where you could stash whatever it was you wanted to hide in the library. Perhaps a bottle of whiskey or two. This secret compartment was added in the 20th century by the final member of the Knight family who, who lived in the house. He died in the 1990s and um, by that time the place was in quite a, a bad state of repair and was sold off. But fortunately it was rescued by the American businesswoman and philanthropist Sandy Lerner and uh, she was the one who established the Centre for Early Women's Writing here which continues to flourish today. Once uh, we leave the library, we can walk down the servant's passage and visit the old kitchen, which is a rather wonderful room. Uh, it still contains a huge black leaded range fireplace. And down the centre of the room is the original work table that still has attached to it a couple of uh, historic coffee grinders, which is uh, rather lovely to see. The kitchen now also doubles as a tea room. And uh, it's a rather delightful space to sit and uh, have lunch or enjoy a piece of homemade cake. There's also in the summer a courtyard where you can sit outside. And this courtyard actually, if you walk out into it, you can go through into the gardens of Chawton House, which are also rather lovely. The main house itself is surrounded by parkland, but there's also a lime walk. There's a shrubbery. There's a really lovely walled garden that was built by uh, Edward Austin Knight. And there's also a wilderness section to ramble in. And um, I love this because it always makes me think of uh, Lady Catherine de Bourg in Pride and Prejudice when she goes to visit the Bennets and she, she says to Elizabeth, Miss Bennet, there seemed to be a prettyish kind of a little wilderness on one side of your lawn. I should be glad to take a turn in it if you would favour me with your company. I often wonder if uh, that prettyish little wilderness was uh, based on the wilderness at Chawton. There are so many little associations like that at Chawton House. It's a very special place to visit if you're a fan of Jane Austen. And it's also an incredible destination if you're a fan of literature in general. And if you have an interest in uh, those early women writers who have perhaps been neglected and forgotten over the last hundred years or so. Chawton House really is a bit of a secret treasure, I think. And so if you're planning a trip to Chawton, if you're planning to go and visit the Jane Austen's House Museum at the centre of the village, don't forget to wander along the leafy lane and find Jane Austen's great house as well. It's a wonderful house to visit. So, that concludes our tour of Chawton House, and uh, I hope you've enjoyed exploring it with me. I'll put a link to the uh, website for the house in the description below the video, so you can plan your own trip. And meanwhile, I hope you'll be able to join me again soon for another relaxing audio adventure. Until then, thank you so much for your company. Goodbye.